but recently I put up a video about winter travel and camping and basically the whole thing was based on uh, the, the points I mentioned were based on recent traveling I did getting from Quartzsite, Arizona to Wyoming in February. Uh, now, of course, when you do a video like this, you can never cover every single point, every single uh, idea, um, or else it would be so long nobody would watch it. Uh, <laughs> but there were a few things that came up in the comments that I thought were worth highlighting in a separate video about winter travel and camping because uh i know not everybody reads the comments these are there are four things that came up specifically that i thought were really good points and were worth following up on a separate video that would be good to to be aware of or to think about if you plan on doing some winter travel and camping first i had a question about what am i doing with tanks and of course i've been in a van for quite a while but i'm now in a travel trailer as of last summer and but I was traveling down where it's warm. Now that I'm back in the winter country, what am I doing with the tanks? Well, I have a fresh water tank and I have a gray water tank and a black tank. Um, so when I what I did was when I, I planned it to be low on water and then I dumped the remaining fresh water before I got into really cold country, made sure that the holding tanks were dumped. I have antifree, RV antifreeze in the holding tanks and the drains. So I'm just doing a van lifestyle for right now. And the reason is it's fairly it's been fairly mild for the most part for Wyoming in February, but we have had several nights already where the temperature's down to the teens, and there are a few more in the forecast, the extended forecast where it's gonna drop into the teens. Other nights it's only getting into the low thirties or upper twenties, and that's not a problem, at least in this trailer. I've I've camped in that in the winter, not had a problem with any of the water systems. But uh, I keep the cabinet doors open and the heat running overnight if it's in the 20s. Uh, not because I need heat at those temperatures, but because I want to keep things from freezing up. And that seems to work all right. But with with temperatures in the teens, I mean, there's just no way to, to uh, keep things from freezing up unless, with an RV. Unless you, like, park and skirt it and put a heater underneath or heat tape on pipes and, and holding tanks and things. And you know, I'm just not wanting to do that right now because I don't have... Uh, a, RV dump here at my son's house where I'm staying. I do have a 50 amp electric hookup, but I don't have a dump. So once weather gets to where it's uh, I'm comfortable, we're not going to have any major freeze ups. I mean, a little below freezing is not a problem, but really cold. Um, I'll be I'll start using the tanks like normal again, and I'll just haul it down to town uh, as needed to dump the holding tanks. Uh, we have a couple of free dump stations here in town uh, one at a city park one at a uh a travel plaza is free dump so um i'll just haul them down there once the weather warms up but for now i'm just doing a van lifestyle using fresh water jugs and you know a five gallon bucket and you all know how that works so um it just keeps it simple and it avoids having to worry about the freezing temperatures all right i also talked a little bit about the heater and while i'm plugged in here i'm using um a, a an electric heater um, but i also have my mr heater portable buddy which it puts out anywhere from 4000 to 9000 btus that i use when it gets really cold and of course i also use that when i'm off grid like when i was traveling i was staying in overnight and, and uh, i did a let's see a walmart parking lot and a a uh, roadside rest area and i didn't have electricity so on those occasions, I use the Mr. Heater. I still have it here as a backup, which is great because my little electric heater works fine on AC, but it's, it does fine for most of the time because the weather hasn't been too bad. But when it gets down into the teens, um, evenings and mornings, it's pretty cold in here. And turning that on for a bit really warms it up. And then the electric heater, and I can turn it off, and the electric heater is able to maintain it. So I, it's handy having the both. And I think I did mention in the other video that I was having some trouble with the uh, Mr. Heater. It was acting up. The flame wasn't burning very clean, and it kept going out. The pilot light wouldn't stay lit. So I did a thorough cleaning on it uh, the other day, and it seems to be working fine again now. I think the thermocouple may be going, and I've not been able to find one locally, so I'll have to order that online and get that replaced um, just to make sure that's not a problem. But what it did kind of bring up, and I think it's a good idea, if you're going to be doing serious winter camping and again this is different from if you're in the desert and it's getting a little cool a few evenings you can you can bundle up and you can be all right like that um but if you're really in winter camping it's probably a good idea to have a spare heating system at the very least if you don't want to go the full second heating system it's probably a good idea to at least have parts on hand and an idea how to replace the service things because um, if you're in really cold weather and if you're doing winter camping sometimes you can make it snowed in or iced in and have to wait it out too and if your heater fails at that point you know you're gonna be in trouble 
So the best way to work around that is just to have an extra heating system or at least have parts so you can fix it if something does go wrong. And if you're using propane or diesel or whatever else, make sure you get enough fuel on hand for longer than you need as well because, again, the heater doesn't work if you run out of fuel. So the Mr. Heater, the most common thing is going to be like the thermocouple or just needing to be cleaned good. I, I, you know, there are some other things you might replace, but a lot of people don't want to work on those things because, first of all, they're a propane appliance, and secondly, they're not the easiest things to get all apart and get to. Um, it's not like a lot of other appliances, like your gas hot water heater in your in your RV, for example, where it's pretty easy to access and, and service. And if you're talking about like a diesel heater, I would definitely be carrying a, a spare glow plug and a fuel filter and fuel pump, maybe some fuel line, because if any of those things fail on you, those are kind of common failure points. So if any of those fail, you at least want to be able to get it fixed to get back in service as soon as possible. All right, let's talk about butane. That's another one that came up. Um, if you have a butane camp stove, I do have one, a little Coleman stove that runs on butane canisters. I use it sometimes for outdoor. I used to use it a lot when I was in the van. It's my main stove. I still use it sometimes for outdoor cooking, even though I have a propane stove in the trailer here. Um, like if it's summer and I don't want to heat up the trailer, I may cook outside. Well, when butane, when it starts getting down to uh, free below freezing, it doesn't light. Now, there are blends you can get blended fuels that that will lower that uh threshold a little bit more it'll take it a little bit colder but you're still going to reach a point where if it's really cold it just won't light so if that's your stove or your heat it's just not going to light when it gets very far below freezing i've run into this camping where i get up in the morning to make coffee on a brisk morning and realized the stove won't light uh, in that case i was able to stuff the butane canisters in my jacket go back inside and let the butane warm up for a bit and then once the gas warmed up even though the outside temperature hadn't warmed up the the butane itself had warmed up and i was able to to, to use it and light the stove without a problem i actually ran into it on my trip up here uh, i got up in the morning when it was really really cold outside and around two degrees that night i got up in the morning i was trying to light the stove to make some coffee and even though it's a propane stove which will light in cold temperatures i don't my stove does not have a pilot light it does not have electric ignition so i have to light it with a lighter with a butane lighter and my butane lighter would not work so now i could have put it in my jacket and warmed it up and i, I didn't mess around with it i needed to get on the road and I just stopped and got some coffee uh in, in the first town i came to I thought I had some wooden matches around somewhere. I don't know where they are, if I do still have them. Uh, maybe they're in the van or something even. Uh, I didn't mess with it because it was just, it was too cold to want to mess around with it. And I needed to get on the road. So, um, but that's the thing. If your butane lighters aren't going to work, your butane stoves aren't going to work when it gets really cold. Unless you take the fuel and put it inside your jacket or put it in your sleeping bag or something so you can keep it warm. Uh, so that, that's just something to be aware of if you're in cold weather and you're using butane okay finally fourth point you know and what really think is worth mentioning is safety alarms um and specifically we're talking here smoke alarms uh and carbon monoxide alarms and propane alarms early warning matters and and you're in a small space and a, a space the size of a van or, a, or to rv it can go up fast if it catches on fire so we really want to have smoke alarms to alert us early to any problem and uh, similarly, carbon monoxide, that, that's that's a bad one, and it gets a lot of people in trouble, causes a lot of harm each year. So, again, that alarm, that indication, uh, I'd have both of those in my rigs, um, the van and in the trailer. Uh, the only time the one of the vans ever, the carbon monoxide alarm in the van has ever gone off is when I forgot a back window open, a vent window open was driving, and it was sucking enough fumes from the exhaust into the van that it actually tripped the carbon monoxide alarm. So, that, that I had to stop and fix that because aside from carbon monoxide concerns the alarm was driving me crazy so um, and of course i've had the smoke alarms go off never for anything serious but because you're cooking in a very small space you get a little too much smoke going off something and the alarms will be going off but really important if there's a fire or if there's a carbon monoxide uh, situation building up and propane alarms are great they're a little more expensive uh, and they're hard to find locally you may have to order it online or or maybe you can find it in an rv store or something but Again, if you have a propane leak, these things are sensitive and will go off and alert you that there is a propane leak happening so you can get outside, shut off your gas uh, until you figure out the problem is. That's a big deal. The propane, once it builds up to a certain percentage of the air inside of a space, it is ignitable, and any spark or ignition source can set it off, and the results are disastrous. So a uh, really good idea to have a propane alarm if you have any propane in your rig 
or your trailer, your RV, whatever it is, a uh, good idea to have that. And on a related note, uh, it's a good idea to have a fire extinguisher. I actually have two. Um, right now they're both in the trailer because that's where I'm using for um, uh, my living space. When I was in the van, I had both of them in the van. Uh, in a van, you're not going to put out an engine fire or whatever. You have an engine fire. Um, you, you open the hood on any modern van or or class crv and you're you can't even see the engine it's mostly under the dashboard in the doghouse so you'd have to pull off the doghouse and you're not going to be able to do that in the case of an engine fire um it'll be fully involved before you can get the doghouse off and remove so you can spray it but but we do have electrical things in uh, our, our vehicles or our, our rigs and we do have uh, most of us cooking in the rig and those are two common sources of uh fires in houses and rvs and campers and stuff so so the combination of having an early warning that there is a problem, the smoke alarm goes off, then you have the opportunity to grab a fire extinguisher and hopefully extinguish any flames before uh, it becomes a fully involved fire. So these are just four more uh, thoughts around winter camping and travel that came up in the comments on the last video I did. And like I was saying, you know, re really other than the safety alarms, the rest of this stuff is only going to be a big deal if you're camping in truly cold environments like uh wyoming in february for example or utah in february uh if you're if you're in the desert um you know you can probably work around some of these things a lot easier if uh you know it's just cool temperatures you're encountering so thanks for joining with this video everybody hope you found these tips or these thoughts helpful let me know in the comments what you think about winter travel and camping what tips or tricks you use to stay safe and reasonably comfortable when you're in really cold weather or snow or ice or what have you well, again thanks for joining me for this video we'll catch you in the next one